This presentation will describe a case in which the differences between static and dynamic compliance facilitated a diagnosis and determined management. This is a real case, although the radiographs and waveforms are not from this specific patient. You can see that the patient who is undergoing a thoracic fusion in the prone position develops increasing peak inspiratory pressures during the first hour of the anesthetic. An hour later, that is two hours after the start of the case, the peak inspiratory pressure has increased from a value of 23 centimeters of water to 55 centimeters of water. What are you going to do? The team caring for the patient had attempted to suction the tracheal tube but had not gotten anything back. The team was now considering the possibility of a pneumothorax. How do you decide if you need to insert a chest tube for a pneumothorax? Are you going to get a chest x-ray in the middle of the case? Here's where understanding the difference between static and dynamic compliance can be very useful. This is a graph of airway pressure over time. With standard volume limited or pressure limited ventilation, the ventilator achieves its volume or pressure limits and then immediately cycles to the expiratory phase. The maximum pressure that is achieved, the peak inspiratory pressure, occurs immediately prior to cycling to exhalation. As you can see from the last two waveforms, an inspiratory pause, also known as an inflation hold, has been added. As the waveforms show, this has occurred at the end of inspiration. With an inspiratory pause, after the ventilator delivers the predetermined tidal volume, it holds the volume of air in the lung for a variable period of time before cycling to exhalation. This airway pressure time curve shows the inflation hold being added during the expiratory time, as evidenced by the fact that time A and time B are equal. That's not always what happens. With some ventilators, the inspiratory pause is a percentage of the inspiratory time. When this occurs, in the absence of other changes to the ventilator settings, the same volume is delivered over a shorter period of time. To achieve this, inspiratory flow rate must be increased. Since pressure equals flow times resistance, an increase in the flow rate should result in an increase in the peak inspiratory pressure. Here are some sample calculations that shows what this means. Start with a respiratory rate of 20 breaths per minute. That means that the respiratory cycle time, the interval from the start of one inspiration to the start of the next inspiration, is three seconds. If a, quote, normal, unquote, IDE ratio of one to two is used, that means the inspiratory time is one second and the expiratory time is two seconds. Now assume a tidal volume of 500 milliliters. With an IDE ratio of one to two and a respiratory rate of 20, the 500 milliliters must be delivered in one second. If the tidal volume is delivered as a square wave, that is at a constant inspiratory flow rate, that means the inspiratory flow rate is 500 milliliters per second or 30 liters per minute. Now assume that the ventilator settings are changed such that an inspiratory pause equal to 50% of the inspiratory time is added. That means that the same tidal volume must be delivered in one half second. As a consequence, the inspiratory flow rate is now 60 liters per minute. Obviously, one of the consequences of this is that the peak inspiratory pressure is likely to increase. Alternatively, if pressure-limited ventilation is being used, the more rapid inspiratory flow rate will likely result in a decreased tidal volume. The other way to add an inspiratory pause is to add time to inspiration. The advantage of this approach is that the inspiratory gas flow rate is not changed so the peak inspiratory pressure should remain unchanged. The disadvantage is that the expiratory time is decreased. This may present a problem for patients with expiratory airflow obstruction. If the expiratory time is insufficient to permit full exhalation, each breath results in more air being retained in the lungs.
whether it's called breath stacking, auto peep, or dynamic hyperinflation, the result is the same. Functional residual capacity will increase and, over time, the peak inspiratory pressure will also increase. Notice that not only is the peak inspiratory pressure increased, but PEEP is also increased. Think about the consequences of breath stacking. Assume that with shortening the expiratory time, exhalation is complete except for 10 milliliters. If this were to remain constant, assuming a respiratory rate of 12 breaths per minute, that means that every minute the volume remaining in the lungs at the end of exhalation is increased by 120 milliliters. The result is that over the course of just five minutes, the lung volume at end exhalation is increased by 600 milliliters. The normal FRC is about 30 milliliters per kilogram in an adult, or about two liters in a 70 kilo adult. As a result, with a respiratory rate of 12, retaining only 10 milliliters per breath would result in a 30% increase in FRC at the end of the first five minutes. It wouldn't take long before the intrathoracic pressure would be substantially increased and the physiologic consequences resemble those of a tension pneumothorax. There are several ways to determine whether or not exhalation is complete. Probably the easiest is to look at a flow volume loop. Most modern anesthesia workstations are capable of generating flow volume loops. As demonstrated in this illustration, if exhalation is not complete before the onset of the next inspiration, flow will not return to zero. The same phenomenon can be seen on ICU ventilators and a few anesthesia workstations which generate flow time curves. Again, it's evident that the flow does not return to zero before the next tidal volume is delivered. Ventilators or anesthesia workstations which generate volume time curves will also indicate that some volume is retained at the onset of the next inspiration. Now back to the airway pressure time curve. As previously noted, this graph shows the inspiratory pause being added at the end of inspiration with an apparently unchanged fresh gas flow rate as evidenced by the fact that the peak inspiratory pressure is unchanged after the addition of an inspiratory pause. Note that with the addition of the inspiratory pause, a new airway pressure, the plateau pressure, can be determined. This is commonly measured immediately before the ventilator cycles to exhalation. Now it's time to consider the factors involved in determining both peak inspiratory pressure and plateau pressure. Peak inspiratory pressure is determined by tidal volume compliance, resistance, and PEEP. The effect of tidal volume on peak inspiratory pressure is straightforward and will not be addressed further. Unless otherwise noted, the following discussion assumes volume-limited ventilation with a constant tidal volume and a constant inspiratory flow rate. What about compliance as a determinant of peak inspiratory pressure? The formula for compliance is straightforward. What may not be as straightforward is that there are three different forms of compliance. Lung compliance is a reflection purely of the compliance of the lung itself. Pulmonary edema, atelectasis, and pneumonia are examples of conditions that decrease lung compliance. Chest wall compliance includes not only the thoracic cage, but also the diaphragm. Examples of factors that cause a decrease in chest wall compliance include kyphoscoliosis, obesity, and increased intra-abdominal pressure, for example during laparoscopy. Although it's possible to measure lung compliance and chest wall compliance separately, those measurements are uncommon in clinical practice, especially in the setting of the operating room. Instead, consideration is usually given to compliance of the pulmonary system as a whole, that is, lung compliance and chest wall compliance. Although this is often described as, quote, lung compliance, unquote, it is prudent to understand that this involves more than simple compliance of the lung itself. What about airway resistance? 
you know that pressure equals flow times resistance. Accordingly, an increase in resistance will result in an increase in peak inspiratory pressure. Although asthma is the prototypical example of increased airway resistance, for the purposes of this discussion, it may be easier to consider other factors that cause an increase in airway resistance. Examples would include a foreign body in the airway or use of a tracheal tube size that is too small. Remember the comment earlier about how providing an inspiratory pause that usurps part of the inspiratory time will result in an increase in flow rate. Obviously, because the inspiratory flow rate is increased, that will translate to an increase in peak inspiratory pressure as well. Finally, how does PEEP alter peak inspiratory pressure? Positive end expiratory pressure, that is PEEP, is another factor that will produce an increase in peak inspiratory pressure. Depending on where the patient is on the lung's pressure volume curve, the increase may be equal to or less than the amount of PEEP applied, but there will essentially always be some increase in peak inspiratory pressure with the application of PEEP. What about plateau pressure? Since by definition flow equals zero during an inspiratory pause, resistance is no longer a consideration. It doesn't matter how large the value for resistance, if flow is zero, the product of the two is also zero. Now there is a basis for determining the etiology of an increase in airway pressure. Assuming neither tidal volume nor PEEP have changed, changes in peak inspiratory pressure are determined by changes in compliance and resistance. Since there is no air flow during the inspiratory pause, plateau pressure is determined only by changes in compliance. Accordingly, since peak inspiratory pressure is determined by resistance and compliance, but plateau pressure does not include airway resistance, in the absence of any other changes, the degree to which plateau pressure is increased may be attributed directly to a decrease in compliance. This makes it possible to determine the factor causing an increase in peak inspiratory pressure. If peak inspiratory pressure and plateau pressures are comparably increased, the problem is related to compliance. If peak inspiratory pressure is increased but plateau pressure is unchanged, the problem is related to airway resistance. Back to the clinical question. The issue was how to deal with a patient who had peak inspiratory pressures that had increased from 23 to 55 centimeters of water over the course of two hours. Use of the two different pressures, peak inspiratory pressure and plateau pressure, allows calculation of two different values for compliance. Use of the peak inspiratory pressure results in a determination of quote, dynamic compliance, unquote. Use of the plateau pressure results in a determination of, quote, static compliance, unquote. Initially, after being turned prone, the patient had a peak inspiratory pressure of 23 centimeters of water with a tidal volume of 800 milliliters. The resulting value for dynamic compliance, 35 milliliters per centimeter of water, is somewhat low compared to a quote normal unquote value of 50 to 100 for patients undergoing positive pressure ventilation. That having been said, it's not surprising given that the patient weighs 110 kilos and is in the prone position. An hour later, the peak inspiratory pressure had increased to 30. The calculated value for dynamic compliance had now decreased to 27 milliliters per centimeter of water. Unfortunately, no measurement of static compliance had been obtained at the start of the case or at this time. Now, two hours after the start of the case, you're confronted with a peak inspiratory pressure of 55 and are concerned about the possibility of a pneumothorax. Dynamic compliance has decreased to 15 milliliters per centimeter of water. Adding an inspiratory pause has the potential to help narrow the differential diagnosis at this time.
If the plateau pressure is only slightly lower than the peak inspiratory pressure, the value for static compliance is also markedly decreased, and the problem is due to decreased lung compliance, and a pneumothorax must be a serious consideration. If the plateau pressure is dramatically less than the peak inspiratory pressure, the value for static compliance is essentially unchanged, and the problem is most likely due to an increase in airway resistance. As previously noted, this was a real case. In this circumstance, the measurement of the plateau pressure two hours after the start of the case revealed that the plateau pressure was essentially the same as the peak inspiratory pressure was at the start of the case. It's clear that the airway resistance has increased dramatically during the course of the procedure. Now it's obvious that the patient doesn't have a pneumothorax as the cause of the increased peak inspiratory pressure. The case was simply allowed to continue, and at the end, when the patient was returned to the supine position, it became evident that the tracheal tube was kinked in the posterior pharynx. In summary, the addition of an inspiratory pause should help narrow the differential diagnosis for the etiology of an increase in peak inspiratory pressure. Remember, however, that if inspiratory time is shortened as a result of the inspiratory pause, peak airway pressure will likely increase further. Conversely, care must be taken to ensure an adequate amount of time for exhalation if an inspiratory pause is applied during the expiratory phase. Thank you. I hope this presentation has been useful.